Okay. Good morning, everybody. I want to tell you a little bit about the plan today. This is uh, my daughter's monkey. So my daughter is now 28, <laughs> but this Elizabeth was, uh, this used to be her monkey. And she donated him a long time ago so that he could uh, go in the balcony up there. What jo Jonathan's plan is, is he's got an electromagnet that's wired up there. You can see this wire coming from the tennis ball launcher. And he's going to hang the monkey oh, over there, sort of to the right of the screen in a few minutes. <laughs> and sometime between now and the end, what's going to happen is that there's a beam in front of this tennis ball launcher so that if I shoot a tennis ball and it breaks the beam, what it will do is release the monkey and he'll start falling. Anyway, so that's going to be the demo. We'll talk a little bit. Basically, we're uh, getting into projectile motion. See if that works. Where am I? It works. The thingy works. is. Uh, I do want to give you a warning a little bit about this week's practical. So there's no experiment this week in practical. I thought it might be good to use these two hours to, um, to practice for, for the term test, which is coming up next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. There's a term test. So what I'd like you to do is um, we're going to do a little 15-minute like mock quiz. And mock meaning that it's, it's not marked. You're going to self-mark it and it'll be for participation only. But it is going to be probably a chapter four uh, question, um, and it'll be very similar exactly in format to the written question on next Tuesday's test. So why don't you get used to writing things out? Um, and, so, and also using your aid sheet, so it's probably good to bring an aid sheet, um, but you're allowed these other things as well. You guys okay with that? Questions about that? Yep, question? Yeah, this is, ex this is all the, list, the exact list, same list of the stuff you're allowed in the term test. And so that's what I'm trying to do with this mock quiz is trying to sort of simulate that feeling you're going to have for the term test. So you're allowed an age sheet, just one, again, age sheet. Um, it should have the stuff from chapters two, three, and four on it, all these equations that are in the summary, because I'm not going to give you an equation sheet. Um, if there's numerical constants, I would give those to you, um, but the, the equations you need. You can also bring a calculator. That's a good thing to have. Get, get used to using that. Okay. Good question. Um, this was on the, this morning's pre-class quiz, but basically I just wanted you to get used to um, splitting forces into their components. So in this situation, you've got y is up and x is the, the direction that the sled is sliding. So there's a diagonal force. And you may have various different ways of doing this, but basically, you, when you have a diagonal force, if you're going to uh, set up Newton's second law, there's going to be Newton's second law in the y direction and Newton's second law in the x direction. So you will always need to split your um, your equations into, or your forces, into the x component and the y component. Because um, normal force doesn't have an x component, it's just long y, so you don't have to split that one. And, you know, friction, I guess, would only have an x component, it doesn't have a y component. So, so it's the diagonal, so you have to draw it. So I would draw it like this. This is your t, this is your t sub y, and this is your t sub x. And these are both going to be positive, I think, the way x and y are defined. And so, for example, I think it was asking what's the x component of tension. Well, then you use cosine of theta is the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse always being the force itself, the real force. And then those, uh, I guess, the, op the opposite and adjacent are going to be the components. And then I solve it out, T multiply both sides by, by t so that this, these t's cancel, and you get that um, t sub x is equal to t times cosine of theta. So you just take the, I think it was given that it's 100, so t sub x is 100 multiplied times cosine of 37 degrees. And I got, and I know it's positive, so that's, that's the x, x component there. So splitting a force into its two components 
is something you have to do quite a lot in chapter four and, and future chapters, so get used to doing that. The same exact thing is that, but this time, um, what's weird is that I have decided to define my axes so that they're tilted. So the kid is sliding now down um, an incline with some constant angle of theta. And I have found, so there might be a normal force, there's going to be friction, um, but I think the main thing is that the acceleration, if there is any acceleration, is going to be along the slope. So I have found it's always easiest to tilt my axes so that you know that a sub y, if you set this up, then a sub y is equal to zero. It's not accelerating um, in the y direction if I tilt my axis. Otherwise, if I, if I leave y to be straight up and x to be straight horizontal, then you'll have an, a y acceleration and an x acceleration, and it, it really kind of overcomplicates the problem. And so, but if you tilt your axes, it's good. The only issue then is that gravity ends up on the diagonal. So if you write it like this, gravity's down, and so now, since like x is in this direction and y is in this direction, you have components which add up to gravity. So there's mg, the hypotenuse. You need two components that are going to add up to be gravity, which is on the diagonal. So you have to get used to doing this. And the trick is, um, this 30 degrees was down here, right? That's your sort of theta. So I think that this up here is probably 60. And then if you were to draw a triangle that goes like this, then since this is 90 and this is 60, I think this ends up being 30 down here. It takes a little bit of doing geometry, but the, summing all the interior angles in a triangle, I think, has to be 180. So, so anyway, I think what it ends up being is that if this is um, the force of gravity in the x direction and this is the force of gravity in the y direction, um, but it's going negative, right? So I would say that uh, sine of this 30 degrees is going to be F sub g sub x divided by mg. And cosine of 30 degrees is going to be the adjacent, which is negative fgy divided by mg, something like that. So hopefully you guys can do that kind of math. Comes up a lot. Any questions on that stuff? OK. Do we always draw a force diagram arrows in the direction the force is coming from, i.e. pulling a rope? Or is the opposite direction? So there's, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. I mean, they're all fine, I guess. But the style of that this textbook uses and that I like to use, because it's a nice style, is first, I pick, a, I guess, a system, right? What object? You're, this is, the book calls this the system. And then, all the forces on a particular force diagram have to act on that system. So step two is you just draw it like a dot, and then you draw all the forces acting on it as being, um, so there's like normal, maybe tension, something like that, there's mg, as having their tail connected at the dot, the object, and going away from the object. Even if you're like pushing or something, if you're pushing from the left, f push or something like that, it would be, you draw it this way. I don't like to draw the, the tips of the arrows at the dot. It's just, just sort of a stylistic thing, not too important. Tomorrow's Maria's birthday. So Maria, I don't know if you're here, so happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> but two of your friends mentioned this and then it's completely separate. So it's good to have friends, that's good. All right, so um, pretty soon I want to do a little demo, but let's, um, when we do, can, do you want to switch it over and we'll try the demo first? But what I have is a two meter cart. This is this friction idea, but if I put a cart on this track and I tilt the track, then what happens at any particular angle is you've got a component of gravity which is directed along the track. So it wants to slip. And if it was a perfectly slippery surface, you know, at some time, at point it would slip, okay? But depending on what's on the bottom, so I've got cork here, you go to some certain angle. <laughs> I don't know how high 
high we can go here. <laughs> ah, and then it starts to slip. Woo. And then once it starts slipping, it starts accelerating us way down. We could try another one. This one looks kind of more like a, like velvet or something like that, or should be a little more slippery. Go up a certain amount, some angle. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> you get to that angle and there it goes. Let's try another one. This one is more like a, sort of a, a white plastic surface. So different, whoa, <laughs> that's already too much. So let's start here. So this must have a very low coefficient of static friction and then off it goes. So that's fantastic, thank you. Um, <coughs> basic idea is that you can measure uh, the frictional force and increase it. So I think what they do here is they imagine that you're on a surface, here's a block, and you are pushing it with your hand, push. And with time, you increase, 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 increase this pushing force. So that's one way of doing it. I guess another way is increasing the angle of a ramp, as I was just doing with time. And so um, you're increasing the gravity component of that force. Oh, there goes the monkey. <laughs> Bye, monkey. Good luck. <laughs> Jonathan's going to carry him up there. Um, and then what will happen is that as you're increasing the, the force from at zero, there's no, if you're not applying a force, there's no reason, there's no need for a frictional force, so it's zero. But as you increase the pushing force, the friction force goes up and up and up, I guess, must, in order to keep it in equilibrium. Then it gets to some maximum frictional force. I should, I should say static friction, I guess, because it's keeping it stuck. And then the applied force exceeds the friction, and so the object accelerates. And then at some point, I guess, you reduce the force so that it's at this mu sub kn. So there's mu sub kn, and there's mu sub sn. It's just a nice little way of looking at it. And you can work out, let's work out which angle uh, it's going to slip at. So when is it just about to slip? So let's just assume that the block is at rest. And we're going to set it up at some angle, uh, which I'm going to call theta. And so this is like the surface. This is surface. And um, this is the mass m. And mu sub s is the coefficient of static friction, which you would get from a table or it would be given on the test or something like that. So what you can do, uh, we want to find theta uh, for, um, for just about to slip. Just what I, I sort of look, found experimentally in the demonstration. So, uh, the diagram I would draw here, so uh, the mass is the system. Let's define that. So, what are the forces on it? Well, uh, there's gravity. Let's draw gravity down. I'll call that the force of Earth on the mass or something like that. It's equal to mg. What are the other forces on it? Well, uh, there's a normal force that's perpendicular to the surface. So I'll call it the, the surface on the mass or something. And then uh, there's going to be a friction force which is perpendicular to the normal. And will it be, which way will it be? I, the way I like to think of it is the mass is, wants to slip down the hill, so the static friction has to oppose that. So I would, I'm going to draw the static friction in this direction. F sub s of s on the mass like that. I guess I can put arrows on these things. And then what I want to do is I'm going to uh, define, I'm going to tilt my axes, I guess, so that I've got y like that and plus x like that. Tilted axes. So that um, n sub x is equal to zero. And also f sub s in the y direction is equal to zero. So that's going to simplify some of my equations a little bit. What it the only thing it complicates is the force of gravity. So that I can draw a little um, right angle triangle where 
be careful that the real force is always ends up being the hypotenuse on your diagram. And then you have to also carefully figure out where the heck the theta is. Theta is either going to be up here or down here, and I think it's down here. But you might want to try to convince yourself of that. So, um, so just about to slip. What that means is that f sub s equals f sub s max. And we have an equation for that, which is mu sub s times n. And then I'm going to say that um, f g in the x direction is mg sine theta. I'm getting this from that triangle down there. And f g in the y direction is negative mg cos theta, I think. And so the sum of all forces in the x direction is equal to 0. So that's going to be mg sine theta minus the static friction. And then, um, so this, by the way, is going to say that mu sub s times n is equal to mg sine theta. And then I've got the sum of all the forces in the y direction is equal to 0. Well, that's going to be equal to the normal force minus mg cos theta. So that means that normal force is equal to mg cos theta. And now what I can do is sort of combine my equations. I've got normal here, which I don't know. And I can plug it into here and solve for theta. Plug in. Makes sense. Um, solve. So if I plug it in. I'm going to eliminate n, and I'm going to solve for theta. So I'm going to say mu sub s times mg cos theta equals mg sine theta. And I think I can divide both sides by mg, since there's mgs and there's an m there, m there, g there, g there. Divide both sides by both. And I get that mu sub s uh, equals sine theta divided by cos theta which is actually, I think, some people know this as that it's tan theta. So theta max is tan to the minus 1 of mu sub s. So what's interesting is that it doesn't depend on mass. So I've got a question for you, a conceptual question, that's based on this same idea, which is that, <clears throat> OK, so the angle it's about to slip, you can measure that in an experiment like we did. Well, what happens if um, you have it, an empty box like the one I have, and you start adding mass to it? So, but you keep that angle fixed. So here's the top hat question. An empty box is on an incline, and it doesn't slip. So we're below that theta max a bit. And I start adding rocks, but I keep the angle fixed. Should it slip, or doesn't slip, or it depends on the angle? So maybe think about that, and then pair up and share with your neighbor. Make sure you kind of agree with your neighbor on this one. Oh, it seems like uh, 
So just 20 seconds to click that in, and then we'll try to do the demonstration and see if this is really true. Ten seconds. OK. Let's see what the survey says. <laughs> Okay, so it's kind of 50-50 here. Should we try it? Um, so, I mean, what I can do, let's use this one that's pretty slippy, whoop, and just go just a little below where it wants to slip. Let's put it really right around here. And then, oh, it wants to slip. Let's put it right around there. It's kind of hard to get it. And then I'm going to add mass to it. Oh. <laughs> So what I think is happening is that it's getting, I mean, there's, there's more gravity on it, but there's also more normal force on it. So it's not going to slip. And I would just say the more and more I press on it, it still doesn't want to slip down the hill. Well, <laughs> anyway, with the amount of mass I've given, given it there, we could try another one of these. Let's try this felt one. So that's a lot higher, right? Whoop. Let's try this cork one. if we're really going to. There we go. So it's not slipping. Let's add some mass. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's take the mass out again, see if it slips. It's not supposed to slip. OK. <laughs> so OK, sort of worked. Um, the, the idea is that it does, that theta max does not depend on mass. It's what we just solved out. It's just it's supposed to be 10 to the minus 1 of mu sub s. <laughs> Friction is a tricky thing. OK. So it doesn't slip um, since. Make sense? OK. All right. So let's do another chapter 4 kind of problem. Um, here you've got a mass, capital M. It's on a track, which is at some angle. And instead of friction, you have a frictionless surface, but you have a pulley. And then there's a hanging mass going off of the pulley. And the mass, lowercase m, is the hanging mass. And the question here is just, what's the acceleration of the cart given some little angle? So what I have here is I have two connected systems. It's OK to define more than one system. Um, one is that I've got this cart, which I can kind of try to draw. And the tension is pulling it up the hill. Cart of uh, mass m. And the other is I've got this hanging mass where the tension is pulling it up, hanging, I guess, lowercase mass. And the acceleration magnitude is the same for both because they're connected by a string. So I think if, if the hanging mass moves like one centimeter down in some amount of time, then since they're connected, the cart has to go that same distance, right? Sort of like moving together. Acceleration magnitude. That's called an acceleration constraint. It is the same for both. Or both systems. Because they're connected by a string. Because they connected by a, by a string that doesn't stretch or something. OK. <coughs> so. Um, I am going to, I guess, assume there's no friction on the cart. So that'll simplify that diagram on the cart. And so let's draw a force diagram for the cart. Well, uh, there's gravity down. 
I'll call that capital M times G. There's tension up, and then there's this angle, I might as well put right there, which is that theta, and then there's this, the normal force. And I think those are the only three forces since there's no friction. And I guess I can, it's nice to define my axes, tilt my axes, because it might accelerate in the x direction, right? But not in the, um, in the y direction. So that's sort of that one. And then, um, and then I guess the diagonal force that we're going to have to decompose is, um, is mg. So it goes like this. I could call this maybe fg is equal to mg. Um, if this is fg, and then this, I'm going to draw my triangle kind of like that, where this is negative fg in the y direction, and this is actually negative fg in the x direction. So the way I've defined my x-axis, the gravity has a component in the negative x direction now, pulling it backwards. Um, so I've got that uh, sine of theta is equal to negative fgx divided by um, fg. And I guess also um, cos theta is equal to negative fgy divided by fg. Okay. And then the other uh, force diagram is the hanging mass, which is, um, just sort of draw it like this, the tension is up, and then uh, Fg is lowercase m times g is down. And what I want to do here is I'm going to define uh, plus x is down. And the reason I want to do that is because if the cart goes in its plus x direction, then I want the mass to go in its plus x direction. So the acceleration signs are the same for both. It's a nice little trick. Um, so the reason I do that is that this way, um, A is the same for the mass and the cart. So the cart, is going to have um, the sum of all the forces in the y direction is going to be equal to the normal force minus fgy, or I guess plus fgy, but that's going to be negative. So it's negative, it's n minus mg cos theta, because the y component of the gravity force is negative. Careful that. And then this, the sum of all the forces in the x direction is going to be tension plus the fgx, which is going to be tension minus mg sine theta. Turn the page here. Shift that over a little. And so um, there's no y acceleration of the cart, because it, it's only going to accelerate along, like parallel to the direction of the track, not, not like in and out of the track. So that means that the sum of the forces in the y direction are, is zero, it balances. So that's N minus capital M G cos theta. So that, I can solve that out for the normal force, M G cos theta. Same as we did before actually. And then A sub X is the sum of the forces in the X direction divided by capital M now for that mass. It's gonna be T minus capital M G sine theta divided by M, but we don't know the tension. So we can't solve this. So what we're going to use now is the hanging mass. The reason here is that I don't have tension, so maybe we'll try the hanging mass. In this case, a sub x is the sum of all the forces in the x direction divided by lowercase m. It's going to be mg minus t, because mg is, the, is down, the plus x direction, and the tension is up in the negative x direction. So if I call this equation two and that equation one, what I've got is two unknowns and two equations. Two unknowns are the acceleration and the tension. And we don't care about the tension, but we need the acceleration. We don't care about um, T. So we're going to solve for uh, T in equation one and then plug in 
to the other equation. That's a nice way of eliminating one variable. Use one equation to solve for the variable you don't care about, and then plug that into the other one. So, so we're going to use one to solve for t. A is equal to t minus m g sine theta over capital M. M A is equal to t minus m g sine theta. So t is equal to capital M times A plus g sine theta, I think. And I'm going to plug this into the hanging mass equation, into 2. And I get A is equal to mg minus capital M times A plus g sine theta, all divided by big M, or little m. And then just solve out for A. So you've got to gather all the A's on one side of the equation. So I'm going to, it takes a little bit of time here. I can divide M. I get uh, A is equal to G minus capital M over lowercase m times A minus M over lowercase m G sine theta. And now gather terms of A on one side of the equation, plus M over M A equals G, and pull out the G factor times sine theta. Um, and then pull out the factor of A here. It's 1 plus capital M over M equals all this stuff. And then so A is equal to G times little m minus m sine theta over m plus m. And what we can do here is, so that's the answer. I guess the limits, if you want to think about that, is that if the hanging or the cart mass is much, much greater than the hanging mass, then I think A is just equal to negative G sine theta. It's as if the little hanging mass isn't there at all, and it'll just slide backwards with G sine theta. So that makes sense. I guess also another limit is that if theta is equal to zero, then you get A is equal to G M over M plus capital M. So we sort of did that before where you've got a hanging mass and just a flat table, frictionless table, and accelerates. And I think also if um, the hanging mass is much, much greater than the cart, then I guess A is equal to G. It's as if the cart isn't there and the hanging mass would just fall with acceleration G. So that, that's good as well. So it's good to check the limits sometimes. Okay. Those are the main things I wanted to talk about with all these frictions and pulleys. Solving all these friction pulley equations. I want to talk a little bit about projectile motion. We'll try to do this monkey thing. Is the monkey up there? It is. Yeah. Do it in a minute. <laughs> I'll post up this solution with the notes. Are you good? Okay. Um, so this is this idea that when you have a object that's flying through space and there's only one force acting on it, then if it's got a horizontal component to its motion, there's going to be this parabola trajectory. That's the name, it's special name of that curve. So uh, let's do this quick little question. Top hat question. At time zero, what you do is you drop a ball, but at the exact same time, you shoot uh, ball two horizontally. And there's a flat floor beneath it. They both are going to hit the floor a little later. Which would hit the floor first? Ball two that goes straight down, drop from rest, or ball two that is fired exactly horizontally at some initial velocity, a large velocity?
to bass. 15 seconds to click into this one. OK, let's see what people said. <laughs> so another question there. Are we almost ready for this? Oh, boy. So, so this is good. So, uh, so, but what this basically means is that if I take like one bullet and drop it, and I take another bullet and I, I shoot the gun, that they would both hit the ground at the exact same time, as long as it's sort of flat surface. It's kind of hard to believe. But I mean, they're both being acted on by gravity. It's just, I think what we're not used to is that very, very large horizontal component of the velocity. So it'll hit the ground at the same time, but it'll happen way, way, way over there <laughs> after it's gone through somebody or something like something bad has happened. So, 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 so the point of this is that you can kind of separate out your X and your Y components with projectile motion. And they have the same T, um, but they're, they're not kind of affecting each other. So the difference between ball one and ball two is that I guess V0x is equal to zero in this case, and V0x is not equal to zero in this case. But V0y is equal to zero, and V0y is equal to zero, and it's only the y component of motion that determines um, how long it's gonna take to hit the ground, right? So I'll just show you a couple quick slides, and then we'll try to do this demo here. Uh, projectile motion is made up of two independent motions. It's uniform motion at constant velocity in the x direction and free fall in the vertical direction. So you've done both of these. You've got acceleration a sub x is zero, I guess, right? And a sub y is negative 9.8. That's it. You know how to deal with both of those, so you just deal with both sort of separately. And Again, this is neglecting air resistance, but uh, it sort of makes sense in terms of relative motion, right? If, you're just, if you just throw a basketball up and down in your frame, it's going to be like free fall with zero um, X component. If you're standing on roller skates and skating along at a constant velocity, constant X velocity, you can still throw the ball up and it comes down into your hand. And for the observer who's not moving, they'll see this projectile motion, but it'll see this, it should take the same amount of time. And this is just showing some of the numbers involved with it. If you launch something with a Y component of plus 19.6 meters per second, and then an X component of velocity, initial velocity, so this is like V0Y is equal to that, and V0X is equal to that, and this is like meters per second, and this is meters per second. Then a second later, what will happen is that the Vx will be the same, still plus 9.8, and Vy will have decreased by 9.8. And then another second later, V sub x is the same, V sub y will have decreased by another 9.8, and now up here, v, Vy is momentarily zero, and then there's negative 9.8, and it ends up, and it comes back to the same height, it's now going an opposite y velocity, but the same x. All right. All right. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to have to skip this one. Just let's look at, I'm not going to do that top hat. Um, this is showing some of the equations for projectile motion. Do what I want to do. The presentation. Maybe this one. Yeah. Okay. 
So this is showing um, the equations that you use for projectile motion. Basically, you, you just split it up. You put the x component, and this, in this case, there's only really one equation, because you know the acceleration is 0. So it's, this is sort of the, the key equation. So vx is always the same. It's v initial x. And then for the y component, you have all those same equations of constant acceleration that you had before, just with y. And, and a sub y is negative 9.8. So this is the one I wanted to do now, the classic problem. You've got uh, a monkey. So it's rather violent and sort of seems a little colonial or something. But a monkey is hanging from a branch of a tree and is spotted by a hunter. And the monkey sees because there's a little laser on here. Am I allowed to push the laser button? <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, I don't want to. Oh, there's a button here. OK, good. Yeah. I squeeze that? There's a laser. <laughs> yeah, I can guess sort of see it. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's on his, on his lower right foot. There's a, a little red laser pointed right at the monkey. So what that means is that the initial velocity of this tennis ball when it comes out here and breaks the beam will be directly towards that monkey. So the monkey is scared and when the beam is broken, the electromagnet uh, allows the, the monkey to, at the exact instant, to let go. Okay? So I guess the monkey is figuring that might help because you know, Who's going to be able to hit a moving target, right? So I'll let you guys think about that. <laughs> what will happen to the tennis ball? And then we'll actually try it. Maybe we should try it. Yeah, is, it is it all pumped up? Use like another one minute <laughs> or two. OK. <laughs> I'm just going to let you do it, man. I'm going <laughs> to... We're going to leave the top hat open, and we're just going to let Jonathan try this. Maybe give us a countdown or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to use that. We've got about one minute to launch. One are minute are you to gonna, launch. I don't know if the video guy, are you going to be able to get the monkey? <laughs> Zoom out. There we go. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and try to put the monkey at the top of the frame because it's going to fall and maybe we'll see if it hits. <laughs> Got enough pressure? You should decide in your mind if you're rooting for the monkey or Jonathan here. <laughs> I say go, Jonathan. <laughs> okay, we're, we're uh, disengaging the safety lock. <laughs> T minus 10 seconds. <laughs> right. Three, two, one, launch. Oh, so close. <laughs> All right, thank you. He lives another day. <laughs> oh, my God. I think it missed him, but it was just to the right. Yeah, it's the right height. So <laughs> anyway, um, oops, this is going down. OK, so I'm not sure what's going on in the top hat. But basically, uh, the idea here is that had the monkey stayed on the tree, then the ball curves uh, un because under the target because after the ball is launched, the y component of its motion is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And that is going to give you a distance between the, I guess, trajectory without gravity and the actual trajectory of 1 half gt squared. If you can convince yourself of that one. Um, 
So as time goes on, the ball is under its straight line trajectory, which is indicated by, I guess, the laser beam, because laser beams travel in straight lines, is one half uh, gt squared. So, but one half gt squared is also the distance that the monkey falls after he lets go. So the monkey did exactly the wrong thing. Um, so that's so that's the idea. So, okay, Do we have a little bit of time. I want to do a quick little uh, demo, or sorry, quick example of problem 4.60. An airplane is delivering food to a small island. It flies 100 meters above the ground. So put 100. And here's an airplane. It's always good to do a little sketch. Uh, and it goes at a speed of 160 meters per second. And the question is, where should the parcel be released so that it lands on an island? So I think you should release it first, and then it's going to go doo -doo 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 and fall and land on the island. And you can maybe call this distance x, and we'll find x. And I'm going to assume it's released from rest from the airplane. So V zero Y is equal to zero. That makes sense. So what I'll do is I can define my axes maybe to be um, X in this direction and then plus Y to be down. So A sub Y now just equals G. And I don't care, by the way, about the speed that it hits the ground. Uh, v Y final. So that means that the equation that I would use is usually going to be y is equal to v0 y t plus 1 half a sub y t squared. And then I guess the other thing is that a sub um, x is equal to 0, so that means that just vx is equal to x over t. So I sort of have two equations and two unknowns. Um, this is, I'm going to, uh, it's the same t for both. So I'm going to solve for x. Okay. So um, I say x is equal to vx times t. Um, so t is equal to the square root of 2yg, because y is equal to 1 half gt squared. And 2y is equal over g is equal to t squared. So I guess taking square root of that gives you that. So x, if I take this t and plug it into here, I get x is equal to v sub x times square root of 2 times y over g. So it's 160 times 2 times 100 over 9.8. So I get um, x is about 700 meters. So you should drop it about 700 meters before you get to the, to the island. So it's just an example of sort of solving out a projectile motion problem. And my top hat computer has decided to update Windows so I can't show. <laughs> okay, I think that's it for today. Um, uh, on Wednesday, uh, we're gonna finish off chapter four. And here's something to think about. When there's a car on the highway, I would say there's four points in that car. They're at rest at all times, no matter how fast it's going. So where are those points? And I'll see you Wednesday. <laughs>